Good afternoon, East Coast. Good evening, Europe. Good before sunrise, Australia. It's my great pleasure and real honor to welcome all of you on behalf of our network of Russian and other post-Soviet political exiles in the United States and other countries. Welcome you to the forum in support of the International Memorial Society and of its Human Rights Center. We have truly distinguished speakers of international acclaim and participants from, from over a dozen of countries. And when we conceived this event jointly with Pavel Litvinov, we did not really expect it to be this big. But today we are truly humbled to have here the leadership of all four memorial affiliates in Europe, let alone those at the center of this whole story who are joining us from the depth of the struggle. And I'd like to welcome Jan Zbigniewicz Raczynski, the board chair of Memorial International and the board member and former chair of Memorial Human Rights Center. I also welcome uh, one of a tiny group of Russia's elected officials uh, from the democratic opposition. There are very few of them. His name is Alexander Shishlov. He is a member of St. Petersburg Legislative Assembly from Yablaka and a long-standing supporter of Memorial. Now, our association, the main organizer of this forum, was born 10 years ago out of a large-scale protest movement of Russians abroad against rigged elections in 2012. That was also the year of my latest visit today to Memorial Leadership in Moscow, where we discussed when its then board chair, uh, Arsenia Borisovich Raginsky of blessed memory, the possibility of expanding its activities to America. Now, today's event is one of our series of dialogues on topics relevant to our exiles and their friends in the diaspora and beyond. All our events are bilingual, so please feel free to speak in English or in Russian. Пожалуйста, выступайте на том языке, на котором вам удобнее. This forum is also part of our association's involvement in the Human Rights Working Group of Civil Society Organizations, the group that was set up jointly with the State Department in preparation for the Summit for Democracy held by President Biden. Some of the key purposes of the summit are to counter authoritarian threat and to advance human rights in America and globally. This year is intended to be a year of action, leading to the second summit in our association, hopes to add our own two cents to it including by today's event, which is our joint action of solidarity, of amplifying our voices, raising attention to memorial in America, and it must lead us and others to further action of more practical support for memorial. Uh, because all of us know that virtually on New Year's Eve, Russia's kangaroo courts, and when I say this, I really understand it's an offense to these beautiful animals, the kangaroos, to even mention them in this context. So it's really the Putin toy courts, disbanded the Memorial Society and the Human Rights Center, allegedly for violating the foreign agents law. The law itself has been condemned not just by NGOs or politicians, but even by the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner at the time of its adoption. The appeal of the court ruling will be heard on the last day of February and also the European Court of Human Rights has asked Russia to suspend the ruling while ECHR reviews Memorial's complaint. Today, we have gathered for a public testimony of sorts about Memorial's value, but also about its future in Russia and beyond. No one here needs explaining what the Memorial family of organizations mean for Russia's civil society. It is the closest that it has had to a mass grassroots movement. It's also a bridge from Russia's darkest times of terror to some of its brightest and the best 30 years ago that hinted at what Russia could have been. And I remember myself in my late teens at the time running to one of the first Memorial rallies at the Luzhniki Stadium, where Andrei Sakharov spoke. Now let me give him now the floor. Это индивидуальные человеческие судьбы. И только такая общественная организация, как Мемориал, может дойти до каждой э, судьбы, до каждой семьи, э, насколько, э, во всяком случае, может стараться это сделать. Это, и э, не такая официальная организация, скованная и политическими, и э, какими-то кастовыми соображениями не сможет это сделать. Это можем только мы, общественная демократическая организация. И мы будем, должны прослеживать 
историю нашей страны, так как она воплощается в историю ее людей. Last year, as most of, all of us know, was the centenary of Andrei Sakharov. The world marked this anniversary, and the Kremlin too made a lip service to it. But uh, the duplicity of the celebration was revealed by, in fact, the attempt uh, the same year to outlaw memorial that Sakharov helped to create, and that was legalized thanks to his widow, Elena Bonner, request to Gorbachev at Sakharov's funeral. Now, while the country in which memorial was created soon fell apart, Memorial is perhaps the only institution born there that not only survived, but has actually grown beyond the Soviet borders. And its work is bringing together people of many ethnicities and faiths in those neighboring as well as distant places, people that the policies of the present regime are pushing away from Russia. And you will now hear more about it from our remarkable speakers. We will be introducing them jointly with my co-moderator, Christina Rieck from Memorial Germany, whom I am very deeply grateful for her assistance in preparing this event. Thank you very much. I also would like to welcome you all um, to this international event to support Memorial. Um, yeah, Dmitry already introduced me. My name is Christina. I'm a board member of the German Memorial, and I'm very happy to co-moderate this event tonight. Um, I'm based in Berlin, but actually right now I'm in the south of Germany in a small village, and I think I have some inter internet issues. So when you can't hear me, well, let me know. I hope it's, it will be fine. I want to introduce Dr. Nicolas Wert, the president of Memorial France. He is a historian from a distinguished family of immigrants from Russia. Back in Soviet times, he lectured in universities in Minsk and in Moscow, served as cultural attaché at the French embassy in the USSR during the perestroika. He is now Emeritus Research Director at France uh, National Center of Scientific Research. Dr. Wirth is the author of many books, including on Stalin's show trials, the history of the USSR, the Black Book of Communism, a book on Russia's revolutions, and he also collaborated in the creation of a documentary about the Gulag. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to participate in this event. Well, I've been a fellow traveler of Memorial since the beginning. I lived and worked in Moscow during most of the 1980s and 90s and had the great chance to get to know at that time many Memorialtsi, starting with the late Arseniy Raginsky, Lena Zemkova, Irina Flige, with whom I traveled extensively to Koema, Karelia, the Savavki, where I took part many times in the Memorial Summer School, but also Irina Shcherbakova, Sanya Daniel, Nikita Khotin, Nikita Petrov, and others. Uh, Memorial France is the most recent foreign chapter of Mishdunarodny Memorial. We have to this day around 60 or 70 members, mostly scholars in Russian and Soviet history, literature, sociology, demography, economics, but not only. Uh, you can have a look uh, at our numerous activities on our website, memorialfrance.org. As you all know, we are gathered today because of extremely serious, sad, and worrying situation created by the liquidation of Memorial International and Memorial Committee for Human Rights on December 28 and December 29. Of course, the judicial procedure is formally not yet over, but the chances, we all know, of winning the appeal are meager, if not nil. I think when historians in future years will study the history of post-Soviet Russia in the first decades of the 21st century, I'm sure they will consider the end of 2029, the liquidation of Memorial as a landmark, a major turning point of the period. What is the historical meaning of this event? The liquidation of Memorial is first, I would say, a decisive step in the tightening of a state control over the Russian civil society and all the NGOs. It is also a part of a much larger, bigger project, which my colleague, 
Lubin Jurgensen, vice chairman of a French chapter of Memorial with a developed, aimed at promoting in a period of a renewed Cold War, a new Weltanschauung, a vision of a world divided between those who preach a so-called destructive ideology, destructive ideology, fostered by the Western world, and those who cherish the authentic Russian traditional values. In this best Weltauschung, the new national story focusing on the glorious Russian Soviet past, whose apotheosis was the heroic victory of a Soviet people led by the Communist Party and its supreme leader, Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, the Great Patriotic War, is of course central. This national story has, as we all know, since 2020 been engraved in the marble of the Constitution of the Russian Federation, which states that, quote, the Russian Federation glorifies the sacrality of the victory of the USSR in the Great Patriotic War, end quote, and quote, protects the historic truth. Let's remember the words of a general prosecutor in his indictment against Memorial. Quote, this organization acting as a foreign agent promotes a false, deceitful vision of our national history, presents our Soviet state as a sort of terrorist state, and indulges in a permanent criticism of our judicial and security organs. As we know, big trouble, really big trouble, started from Memorial, of course, with the infamous 2012 law against the so-called foreign in, uh, agents, but also when Memorial members, after having drawn for years, lists of millions of victims starting drawing up lists of perpetrators, of NKVD perpetrators. And we can see the gruesome persecution of Yuri Dmitriev, one of the main activists of a Karelian branch of Memorial, recently sentenced to 15 years under false and infamous charges of pedopornography. Of course, the struggle of our memorial friends goes well beyond the borders of history, Soviet history, the Great Terror, Gulag, mass repressions. What is at stake is a struggle for the freedom of thinking, judging, the freedom of expression, what the French call the liberté fondamentale. And this is why it is so important for us to mobilize all people of goodwill from all over the world, from Europe, of course, a large part of this venerable at, at the same time, the continent of enlightenment, but also the dark continent, having shared Soviet experiment, but also to America, Australia, to support Memorial in this very difficult moment. And so I'll thank all of you for organizing this meeting and for really trying and keeping a watch to help in these very difficult days, uh, Memorial. And we'll, I think I will discuss but this was not the matter of this, my little presentation, uh, how to defend in the following days and weeks uh, memorial uh, from these attacks. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you again, Nicola, for this very powerful um, presentation and speech. Yeah, now I would like to give the world the, the, the floor to Andrea Gulotta. Um, Professor Andrea Gulotta is the president of Memorial Italia and lecturer in Russian at the University of Glasgow. He's an expert in the Gulag literature and the founder and editor in chief of Autobiographia, journal on life writing and the representation of the self in Russian culture. 
He's the author of a book on intellectual life and literature at Zolovki in the 1920s. And he's the creator of a virtual exhibition on the culture in the Gulag. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening, uh, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are in this moment. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, truly thank uh, the organizers of these events uh, because it is quite remarkable to see uh, the sheer importance and the sheer um, uh, geographical vastity of the support the Memorial can endure. I will start by speaking briefly about what Memorial Italia is. Um, unlike our colleagues and friends uh, in France, we're not a direct chapter of Memorial. We're an independent association uh, which is uh, registered in Italy, but of course we are part of the network of uh, Memorial International and we've always uh, worked together with Memorial International, which has been not only a fundamental part of our work, but for some of us a fundamental part of our life. Uh, Nicolia uh, Vert before was speaking about being, being a fellow traveller, where some of us have been also uh, very important fellow travellers um, for many, many years. And now uh, uh, some of us are, are, are starting to be a fellow traveller. We keep on new members and I have to say that the current situation is probably fostering this aspect. Memorial Italia was born after an exhibition in Milan about the Gulag and uh, a series of scholars that have been together and they followed the birth of Memorial International and have become friends with many of the founding members of Memorial International, decided to form this association. Of all those people I would like to remember today, Maria Ferretti, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, and who has been the author of a fantastic and pioneering work on the creation of the memory uh, uh, and of Memorial in itself, but especially on the memory of the Gulag uh, in the Soviet Union in the first years. Uh, our association has um, uh, members with different interests. We do have academics with different uh, interests. Some of them are uh, Slavic studies scholars. Some of them are historians. Um, we also have uh, journalists and members of association. Uh, so uh, our activity goes mainly in three directions. The first one is the one of research. The most important probably contribution which we've done has been the creation of a database of the victims, the Italian victims of the Gulag, uh, which is a work with, done by uh, Francesca Gori, who has been the president and the soul of Memorial Italia for 17 years up until last summer when I uh, took her role with great <laughs> difficulty because uh, she's been absolutely outstanding, outstanding in keeping together the association and also the work on the database of Italian victims of the Gulag was made by uh, Emanuela Guercetti and Elena Dundovic. Um, this uh, database is comprised of 1,200 more or less victims of the Gulag. Uh, it's a fundamental piece of research which has then produced exhibitions and publications and so on, and which is continuously updated with new data which, which come constantly. Uh, we also have uh, publications in terms of research. We have two series, one on literature and one of um, uh, history and all the members of Memorial uh, publish continuously and make research about the topics which are at the heart of the agenda of Memorial. So mainly, of course, the Gulag, the history of Soviet repression uh, and uh, human rights in the U U USSR, but also in the post-Soviet area. We also, the second direction, which is fundamental for our association is the one of education. We do constantly have meetings with school. We've had uh, projects, for example, of classes about human rights, and we tend to do as much as possible to start and um, and bring the themes of Memorial into uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the scholar system, the, the the system of schools in Italy. Uh, the third, and I would say uh, right, right now, probably most important aspect, I'm saying right now because, of course, with the latest events, which Nicola has uh, uh, perfectly described, our attention has been mainly uh, attracted to this is the one of agent stakeholders. So mainly the wider public, but also journalists and also politicians, institutions and so on to try to uh, um, uh, spread as much as possible the activities of Memorial International, but also to raise awareness on what are the current issues in the current situation. So we've organized a series of exhibitions. Uh, Dimitri before showed 
um, Sakharov and we've organized an exhibition about Sakharov uh, at the National Library of Rome. We have roundtables of which my colleague Nicola Pianciola will speak uh, later on. We do organize conferences and lately, as I was saying, the work of advocating has been particularly prominent and particularly important. We've had a series of meetings uh, with important institutions, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, the uh, Italian Parliament, uh, the Library and Archive of the Senate. We're trying to do as much as possible to make everyone understand the importance of the situation. And I have to say that it is clear to us that everybody in Italy is aware that the problem of Memorial is not a problem of Russia. The situation of Memorial International is not a situation that can be confined to our colleagues in Russia. It's a universal issue. When memory is at stake, when memory is uh, risking to be put down in silence, um, it's everyone's due and obligation to stand for it. And uh, all these uh, reflections have brought to a series of actions which are, we are doing together with our friends in Russia as well, consulting them and trying to understand how to better help them. Uh, and they're all aimed at underlining the importance not only of the archives and all the uh, um, uh, of the huge richness that Memorial has accrued over the years in terms of archival holdings, but also of the values and the importance of the message that Memorial is sending. For this reason, I'm really particularly grateful to the organizers because this event further underlines the universal importance of um, the case of Memorial and unites people from every corner of the world to uh, fight for Memorial International. Thank you very much. And I'll leave the floor to the other speakers. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was very was a good overview of what you were doing and also what has to be done all together and what we can do together. Um, now I would like to give the word to Pavel Litvinov. Um, he joined us now, I, I think. Um, Pavel is a physicist by training. He was one of the leaders of the Soviet era human rights movement since the later 1960s. And one of the authors of the Chronicle of Current, uh, Current Events. Um, in 1968, he was a co-organizer of the historic rally of the eight on the Red Square against the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. For this, he spent five years in internal exile in the far, far east of Russia. In the US, he taught physics and math in high school. He was a representative of the Chronicle of Current Affairs in the West, created and headed Friends of Memorial Organization, and is currently a member of the board of the Saharov Foundation. Pavel, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for, for all your kind words. And thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Glinsky, uh, Dmitry, uh, for uh, for organizing this thing because it's very important that we are all together in that. It's not only Russia, it's not only United States, it's the whole world. And we know today that nobody is guaranteed uh, against attack of authoritarianism, even uh, the best, most democratic countries like United States. Uh, have some kind of spasms of authoritarianism, hopefully only temporary, but we just have to know that everybody is in the same boat. We all belong to the same human race and, and we have uh, our best and our worst in, in common. And that's why the fact that we have memorial and memorial uh, which is under attack and uh, probably will be at least officially closed, uh, will bring defense from, from the world. What is memorial? What is memorial for? Where did it come from? It came from Russian history, from the Soviet Union history, from human rights movement in, in, in the Soviet Union. Most important thing of memorial comes from the root of, of the word memorial. It's a memory, it's remembering. It's remembering, similar to uh, remembering a memory of people, uh, Jews who were killed uh, during Holocaust. Uh, the same principle for us to remember who and why was executed, were put in prison, 
uh, and we need to, to keep their names. Uh, we need to, to need the, their memory, and only that can guarantee us uh, future freedom, equality, and human rights and peace. Without that, nothing will, nothing will happen. That, that's why we have to defend memorial, which is in big trouble. It, it, it's announced being foreign agent, which is ridiculous, because we, we all are foreigners uh, for, for somebody. And the whole idea of memorial is to defend the rights of people whom government want to announce foreigners because Jews were foreigners in, in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, Hutsi and Tutu in Africa were foreigners to each other. There is no foreigners, and the only thing is the freedom of, uh, of speech. Uh, we can talk about First Amendment of, uh, of Soviet Constitution. We can talk about the principles of Declaration of Human Rights. It's all the same thing. People have to be free to speak up, to demonstrate, to write, to publish, and share opinions with each other. Without that, we cannot exist. And uh, memorial is there to try to keep it, to try to preserve it. It appeared in, in Russia uh, right with the fall of the Soviet Union and and the first participants and uh, ideas of memorial was a memory, the monument maybe uh, of the Soviet uh, people who suffered or were killed, uh, killed by Stalinist and Leninist re regimes. Without that, nothing happens. It's not accidental that people who were founders of memorial like Arseniy Raginsky, uh, uh, for example, uh, and, and many others were uh, political prisoners and participants of human rights movement in the Soviet Union. It's not accidental that uh, the symbolically and practically most important leader of Soviet human rights movement, Andrei Sakharov, uh, was the moving force of memorial. The first president, uh, of Russia, Mikhail Gorbachev supported Memorial. So we need to take the initiative from them and keep going. And keep going meaning to, to collect documents, to do things which already mentioned Yuri Dmitriev did, who found 1,500 uh, uh, bones of, of people who were killed in, in Karelia uh, during Stalinist times. Uh, of course, it's unpleasant and difficult work, but we, somebody has to do it. We can find memories, we can interview people. Uh, there are many people from different countries. Some of them are uh, maybe have relatives or friends who, who went through uh, labor camps and gulag. Maybe they will remember something, maybe they will write, maybe they will create museums, because it's all part of the work of memorial and everybody is, mem is memorial by himself and herself. We can uh, be together physically, we can be separately, we can do it alone, we can uh, distribute uh, uh, the information, but it's all one task, the task that people can and must be together to preserve mere peace and to, to keep uh, us free to speak up. Le let's support and let's speak up for Memorial and let's think that we are all members of Memorial. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, uh, for your remarks. I want now to introduce uh, Dr. Anki Giesen, who is a member of the board of uh, uh, Memorial Germany and of uh, the International Memorial. Uh, she is a historian specializing in the culture of remembrance and the processing of memory, and she works 
in the education department of the land of Berlin, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor for me. And uh, I will now a little talk about Memorial Germany, why there is a Memorial Germany. And uh, our association was originally founded in 19... 93 by Berlin citizens to support Memorial St. Petersburg, especially its social programs for former prisoners of the Gulag and surviving victims of Leningrad blockade. At the same time in Germany, we became involved in the procedure of the conversion of a former Soviet military prison in the city of Potsdam into a memorial site. We published an anthology with essays on this topic and organized an exhibition in the facilities of the former prison. Since the very beginning of our work, we also focused on victims of Nazi crimes who also suffered from Soviet repressions, such as the so-called Eastern workers, civil persons deported to Germany during the war and forced to work in Germany. Returning home to Soviet Union, they were considered unreliable and some of them were sent into forced labor camps. Memorial Germany published memories of witnesses in Russian and German. Later, we start, started joint projects with our memorial branches in Russia, as in Moscow and Perm. One of the results has been an interactive internet portal and a CD on the Gulag system, based on the translation of the Memorial Gulag Handbook labor camps into German, in addition with a map of camps and completed with more than 200 biographies of Gulag prisoners and several essays of scholars. In line with our gradually expanding program, the organization was renamed Memorial Germany and joined Memorial International as a member. Today, Memorial Germany is engaged in a very variety of tasks in the field of human rights work, of education about the repressions of the Soviet regime on Soviet and German soil, and in preserving the memory of their victims. We advise Chechen refugees in Germany, participate in the Last Address and Return of Names projects, organize international summer schools for students, develop teaching materials, and promote the creation of digital archives of materials about the Gulag. In these projects, we often work in cooperation with other memorial association or other civil society organizations from the post-Soviet space. We also provide information about the current situation in the post-Soviet space on our website, social media, and through regular podcasts. Uh, besides the work of Memorial International and its importance to um, the post-Soviet uh, space and to Europe and the world, um, the work of Memorial International is of very great importance, especially to Germany. Uh, because Germany, it helped uh, uh, Germany to, uh, for coming to terms with German past. For example, Thanks to Memorial International, the fate of numerous people deported from Soviet Union to Nazi Germany as so-called Eastern uh, workers could be clarified and compensation payments could be provided to them. Without Memorial, the history of arbitrary arrests of innocent citizens during the period of Soviet occupation on East, of Eastern Germany, the deportation to the Soviet Union to the Gulag or their executions could not have been revealed. Memorial's reputation has made it possible for these victims, who were often in Germany denigrated as Nazis who deserve to be arrested or who even deserve to die, could be brought into the focus of victim commemoration in Germany as well. Currently, as you all know, the Memorial Memorial Network in Russia is under great pressure and needs signs of solidarity from the global society, as well as financial support for court and advocacy costs and the digitalization of the archives in the different, different part of the country is deeply appreciated. Should it become necessary for staff members to leave the country, contact persons and opportunities to earn a living are needed. Anyone who has necessary contacts to university, archives, research institutes and foundations can therefore be of great help now. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anke. Now I would like to give the word to Rabbi Mikhail Rivkin. Um, Rabbi Mikhail Rivkin was trained as engineer and worked in the Mining in Institute in Moscow when he became involved in the dissident movement by distributing Samistat. He was an active member of an underground group of so-called young socialists and the only member of that group who, when arrested, refused to plead guilty and ask for pardon. He was sentenced to seven years in Panel Connolly colony and five years in internal exile. As a political prisoner, he took active part in collective hunger strikes and had to spend over 100 days in sol solitary confinement. In 1987, Andrei Saharov included him on the list of 14 political prisoners urging Gorbachev to immediately release him, them. Mikhail was released and in the same year repatriated to Israel when he did rabbinical studies and became the first Russian-speaking rabbi of conservative Juda Judaism in Israel. He taught for many years at Mitreshet Yerushalayim. Thank you for your invitation. If you excuse me for not speaking English, my English is not good at all. Я был бы очень рад сегодня. Я благодарю вас за приглашение еще раз. Был бы очень рад сегодня рассказать вам, похоже на то, как сделали мои дорогие друзья из других стран, рассказать вам о том, чем занимается международный мемориал его израильское отделение. К сожалению, это невозможно, потому что израильского отделения нет. И, к сожалению, если мы, государство Израиль, если мы в той степени и зазвучали в контексте мемориала, то зазвучали в самом неприятном и скандальном контексте. Я в этом плане чувствую себя достаточно неловко. Я очень надеюсь, что когда состоится следующая подобная конференция, я очень надеюсь, что она состоится, и что мы опять сможем обменяться нашими впечатлениями и мнениями, то в этот момент израильское отделение Международного мемориала уже будет существовать. Я попробую что-то в этом плане предпринять, надеюсь, с моими друзьями, в том числе с доктором Аллой Шаинской. Попробуем. Пока скажу несколько слов о том, что, как мне представляется, происходит с мемориалом. Мемориал, на самом деле, всегда был где-то очень глубоко в поле консенсуса. Даже для тех бывших и нынешних ГБшников, которые сегодня управляют Россией, он всегда оставался, на самом деле, ну, где-то в каком-то таком табуированном поле, которого лучше не трогать. То, что сегодня происходит, то, что идет глоба... тотальное наступление по всем фронтам на гражданское общество, то, что гражданское общество буквально у нас на глазах ликвидирует, безусловно, это не могло не дойти в какой-то момент и до мемориала. Мемориал, который поставил перед собой целью, с одной стороны, увековечить память о репрессиях прошлого, а с другой стороны, вести очень активный мониторинг правозащитной репрессии сегодняшних. Понятно, что мемориал – это такая вот кость, которая застряла глубоко в горле этого ГБшного режима, и что рано или поздно под любым самым надуманным и вымышленным предлогом, конечно, это, этот режим не мог не нанести удар и по мемориалу. На самом деле, сегодня Путин пытается нас, я говорю о множестве числе в первом роде, в первом лице, Путин хочет вернуть Россию к стандартам примерно брежневского времени, не сталинского, но брежневского, когда все очень хорошо понимали, что есть на самом деле два реальных сценария. Либо ты хочешь говорить правду, говорить то, что ты думаешь, тогда ты просто уезжаешь. Либо ты не хочешь уезжать, тогда ты сидишь и молчишь. Или, по крайней мере, ограничиваешь свое гражданское общество пределами своей шестиметровой кухни. И Путин поставил перед собой такую стратегическую задачу. И то, что он преследует своих активных политических противников, этого совершенно недостаточно для решения этой задачи. Он хочет взять именно мемориал как организацию, которая недавнего времени была консенсусом. 
которая проводит очень серьезную исследовательскую работу, которая хранит огромные, совершенно уникальные, бесценные архивы прошлого, он хочет взять эту организацию и сказать, вот смотрите, ребята, вам кажется, что вы занимались чем-то академичным, научным, серьезным, естественно, ничего подобного. В тот момент, когда я, я лично вот решил, что сегодня, с сегодняшнего дня вы не в консенсусе, с этого момента вы иностранный агент, с этого момента вы террористы, экстремисты, с этого момента мы начнем вас сначала официально запрещать, потом сажать. И это будет буквально с каждым. То есть... Путин понимает, что свои два будущих срока, следующие 12 лет, он э, твердо решил посвятить разрешению этой задачи. Половину выдавить на Запад, половину отправить на Восток. Сколько тысяч, десятков тысяч людей э, он должен будет пропустить через эту мельницу? Сотен тысяч. Для него совершенно не важно. Он знает, что у него впереди есть большой срок, и он... Э, на самом деле тоже чувствует себя носителем некоторой миссии. Он, миссия вернуть нас к брежневскому стандарту, когда гражданского общества как такового просто не существует вообще. И любое проявление самостоятельной общественной активности совершенно не оппозиционное, просто самостоятельной, не санкционированной свыше активности автоматически становится криминалом. Будь то архив мемориала, будь то компьютерная игра, где взрываются какие-то вымышленные здания. Вот эта задача Путина. И мы должны взять на себя сейчас вот эту вот очень важную миссию, соединить наши силы и во что бы то ни стало доказать ему, что он не всесилен. И мемори... что есть на самом деле возможности у общественных организаций во всем мире продемонстрировать свою солидарность с мемориалом в такой степени, большой, в такой высокой степени, что даже все эти формальные запреты не решат ту задачу, которую Путин ставит. Не сломят мемориал. Мы должны... И, конечно, я понимаю, что легко говорить это сидя в Украине или за границей, но я, но я знаю, что и в России есть огромное количество людей, которые готовы бороться так же, как в свое время, 40 лет назад боролись мы, готовы идти до конца по этому пути я выражаю им свое восхищение, и я считаю, что все мы, мигранты на Западе, должны оказать им любую поддержку, в любой форме, в любых, в любыми средствами, какие только мы можем придумать. Спасибо большое. Спасибо, Михаил, за ваше выступление. Мы сейчас возвращаемся к, к англоязычным выступающим. Будут представлять профессора Никола Пьянчола. Nicola Pianciola is a member of Memorial Italy and a historian who has taught at Lingdan University in Hong Kong and Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. He has also joined the university, has just joined the University of Padua in Italy, and his research focuses mainly on late Tsarist and Soviet Asia. His publications cover, among other topics, the Great Famine during collectivization in Kazakhstan and the history of forced migration in Eurasia. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this event. And for inviting me, it's a, it's a truly an honor. Um, let me begin on an uh, autobiographical note. Um, I am a historian, and I came into the study of Soviet and Russian history in the first half of the 1990s, when I was a young history student in Italy. Uh, back then, uh, the work of uh, that Memorial was doing uh, to recover the memory and history of Stalinism seemed to me uh, a moving undertaking of truly world historical importance. This was first explained to me by a 1993 book written by Maria Ferretti, um, who has unfortunately passed away not long ago. The title of the book, which Andrea uh, 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 has already mentioned, was The Mutilated Memory Russia Remembers. That book was important to lead me to the job I do and to join Memorial Italy afterwards. I then studied mostly the history of Soviet Central Asia and Kazakhstan in uh, particular. And uh, in the countries that were part of the Soviet Union, only in Russia, Memorial has remained a living organization to this day. But I think it's important to say a few words to remember that the, the recovery of the memory of the crimes of the Stalinist regime was an undertaking carried out by the nascent Soviet civil society before the Soviet Union collapsed. 
So in Kazakhstan, a local memorial chapter was set up in the late 1980s, and it was called Adilet, which means justice in Kazakh. In this organization, which unfortunately um, is no longer active uh, today, basically, they stopped working around 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, activists from Kazakhstan, by far not only Kazakhs, but all, uh, from all the multi-ethnic population of Kazakhstan, have helped reconstruct the memory of Stalinism in the, in the country. Kazakhstan society had been reshaped by Stalinism perhaps more than any other in the Soviet Union because a famine caused by state policies during the early 1930s killed approximately one third of the Kazakh uh, population. And then there were mass deportations and that, uh, that changed the country demographically. Uh, also, given the importance of the Gulag in Kazakhstan during Stalinism, in some cases, uh, memorial activists in the country literally recovered the history of their own city, which until the period of Glasnost could not be talked about openly. This is the case with the city of Karaganda, which grew as an urban center thanks to the expansion of the local Gulag camp in the 1930s. Let me at least mention the name of a journalist and memorial activist in Karaganda, my friend Yekaterina Kuznetsova, whose publications were crucial in this uh, respect. After a period of relatively lack of interest in the Stalinist past, uh, today a new generation of Kazakhs who grew up and sometimes were even born after the economic depression of the 1990s, it's showing a new interest in the traumas to which Kazakh society went through uh, uh, during Stalinism. So although the Kazakh and Russian governments are closed allies, it is impossible for the Russian government's official narrative with its uh, partial but substantial rehabilitation of the Stalinist past not to collide with the memory of Stalinism in Kazakhstan. The continued presence of Memorial in Russia and a plurality of voices about the Stalinist past in the Russian Federation would have helped bring the public opinions, uh, bring the gap between the public opinions of countries like Kazakhstan and, and, uh, um, and Russia. Um, close the gap, sorry. Uh, so I believe that this argument can be made for other countries as well, although for Kazakhstan, with its particularly tragic past, it is even more uh, clear. So I think this is just one example of how memorials work is not only crucial to Russian society, uh, but is uh, important for a significant part of Europe and Asia because Stalinism was a Eurasian phenomenon. So the attack against memorial is not only a threat to the independent preservation of historical memory outside state control in Russia, but it is also a signal, voluntary or involuntary, to peoples and regimes outside the Russian Federation, especially in the countries that share a uh, Soviet past with Russia. So to conclude, let me just reiterate that Memorial Italy is working to keep the spotlight of Italian and international public opinion on what is happening to Memorial in Russia, also with the uh, roundtables on current events that Memorial Italia regularly organizes and uh, to which Andrea refer referred earlier, and to help Memorial in any way we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicolo. I think that was really, really good, really important also to look um, to Central Asia. Um, now we go back to France. And I would like to give the floor to Luba Jorgensen. Luba, I think you're, yeah, you're here. I see you. Great. Uh, Luba is the vice president of Memorial France. She teaches Russian literature at the University of Sorbonne, where she also heads the Center for the Study of the Cultures and Society of Eastern, Balkan, and Central Europe. Her research is on the representations of violence. She led the production of the French edition of Shalamov's Kolima Tales. She is the author of many books, including books about Gulag, the writings of the Holocaust, and on the tourism of memory in Eastern Europe. Luba, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this meeting and for inviting me. I would like uh, to see a few words about a document that the Russian Ministry of Culture has prepared and which have to aim at uh, preserving traditional values in Russia. It also indicates alien ideas and the main threats to the spiritual development of the country's inhabitants. This document that is a, that is a project of a decree defines traditional values as uh, moral guidelines that are passed down from generation to generation and ensure civic unity. Among these traditional values, the document includes human rights and freedoms, patriotism, citizenship, service to the fatherland, responsibility for the fate of the fatherland, a strong family, the priority of the spiritual over the material, historical memory, the continuity of the generations, unity of the peoples of Russia. Among the alien values, it includes cult of, the, cult of selfishness, rejection of the ideals of patriotism, rejection of the procreation, challenging Russia's positive contribution to world history, undermining trust in state institutions, especially law enforcement agencies. The Ministry of Culture, of Culture considers that the main threats come from the activities of extremist and terrorist organizations. The actions of the United States and its allies, transnational corporation, corporations and foreign NGOs, as well as reforms in the field of science, culture, education and information activities carried out without regard to traditions. According to the Ministry of Culture, if all these factors prevail, the state forming Russian people, the foundations of Russian identity and trust in the institutions of the state will be weakened, as well as, as um, friendly and family ties. After reading this document, we understand why international memorial bothers the authority, uh, authorities. Indeed, beyond the violations of the law on foreign agents, which is formally the reason for its dissolution, international memorial is accused of spreading a destructive ideology. This ideology consists, in its case, in recalling painful episodes of Russian history, especially the political repressions of the Soviet period. In the context of the liquidation of an international memorial, memorial, the ideals of human rights and the preservation of memory that the draft decree advocates appear to be the height of irony and cynicism. This document indicates that the state now has a monopoly on historical memory. International memorial is therefore guilty of violenti violating the state monopoly on memory and history. Since its creation, memorial has been working on the reconstruction of the historical memory of Soviet violence. Soviets discovered hidden parts of their history, Stalinism, but also the history of the, of the revolution, the civil war and the Leninist period, which had been largely distorted, rewritten and mythologized. The emergence of civil society in Russia after the disappearance of the Soviet Union was directly linked to the reappropriation reappropriation of history and memory through the work of researchers, commemorations and museum exhibitions. Memorial was an essential actor of, in this reappropriation that has been realized thanks to its library, its archives, its museum, which includes work by prisoners and the tangible memory of the camps, its publications and so on. 
The document written by the Ministry of Culture shows that Russian will have to live again with myths, myths instead of history. We know the old Soviet joke, the future is certain. It is only the past that is unpredictable. At the time when the future, future is more uncertain than ever, than ever, the project of the decree aims to define the past for at least the next six years and to stigmatize those who, like Memorial, work to reconstruct the historical truth and to perpetuate the memory of the victims. And of course, we must help Memorial in every way possible in this situation. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Luba, for your very thought-provoking remarks, and we're thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, now we are going to our next speaker who will be also speaking in Russian. His name is Evgeny Zaharov. He is a director of the Kharkov Human Rights Protection Group in Ukraine. He is the chair of the board of the Ukrainian Helsinki Group and also a board member of the International Memorial Society. Evgeny is engineer by training. He was participant of the Soviet dissident movement in the early 1990s. He was co-chair of the Memorial Branch in Kharkov, as well as a member of the Kharkov City Council and deputy chairman of the City Commission on the Restoration of the Rights of Wrongfully Convicted Individuals. He was editor-in-chief of the journal Human Rights in Ukraine, and in 2014 he was appointed chairman of the Expert Council on Police Reform at the Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs. Спасибо, Дмитрий. Надеюсь, меня хорошо слышно. Хочу поблагодарить за организацию этого форума. Я считаю, что он очень важен и очень нужен. И, и поблагодарить за приглашение выступить здесь. Ну, на самом деле, очень много уже сказано. Мне особенно, честно говоря, нечего добавить. Я хотел бы только подчеркнуть несколько важных для меня моментов. Ну, во-первых, я хочу сказать, что ликвидировать мемориал невозможно на самом деле. Как возможно запретить людям думать, помнить, как нельзя взять в плен бессмертную душу, как говорил Пьер Безухов в романе «Война и мир». Ибо мемориал – это прежде всего люди во всем мире, которые разделяют общие ценности, а только потом формальное отделение юридические лица. Тем не менее, я хочу напомнить, что в мировом числе мемориал – есть четыре структурных отделения во Франции, Чехии, Украине и Перском крае. И есть мемориалы, еще зарегистрированные как юридические лица в Италии, Германии, Франции и Бельгии. Четыре юридических лица в Украине и 32 юридических лица в России. В данной ситуации, когда речь идет о том, что производительство мемориал и, и правозащитный центр мемориал будет формально закрыт, я думаю, что нам нужно будет думать о том, как э, начать э, заново э, как построить новую структуру международного мемориала на каких основаниях и постараться сделать так, чтобы э, таких э, отделений юридических лиц, членов мемориала было как можно больше. Как это сделать э, Технически, я думаю, что это сейчас не стоит обсуждать, это лучше обсудить потом, когда будет яснее наша ситуация. Я хочу еще заметить о очень большой близости мемориалов в бывшем СССР. В частности, я хочу сказать в этом контексте об Украине. Именно, именно нашим российским коллегам мы обязаны тем, что нам известны места захоронения миллионов украинцев, в частности, Рощище Сандермо, где был убит цвет украинской интеллигенции. Более тысячи украинцев, которые, которые создали или, или могли бы создать неоценимые духовные сокровища. Мемориал за 30 лет, за более чем 30 лет, собрал очень много информации и о государственном терроре, о ГУЛАГе и о репрессиях против советских диссидентов. И мы хорошо помним, что путь родственников репрессированных украинцев в мордовские и пермские лагеря на свидание обратно проходил через московские квартиры правозащитников 
которые, собственно, позже и были с, с, среди основателей мемориала. И что на учительном собрании мемориала 40% делегатов были именно из Украины. Еще хочу вспомнить о предтече мемориала, а именно в самозадском альманахе «Память», который был создан во второй половине 70-х годов теми же людьми, которые через 10 лет основали мемориал. А группа молодых людей в Москве, Петербурге, Харькове стала собирать документы, мемуары, фотографии, письма, готовить их к публикации, запускать в самоздат. И э, в эту группу э, входили многие мои друзья, э, Саня Даниэль, Алексей Каратаев. Я тогда познакомился с Арсением Рогинским и Сережей Дедюлиным. И э, э, это была очень интересная затея. Э, я помню, что первый пусть памяти был огромен, 1570 машинописей. Всего было шесть таких альманахов. Их передавали за границу и в какой-то момент решили напечатать там. Пришли, причем члены редакции писали на обложке свои фамилии и домашние адреса. В 1981 году Арсению Рогинскому дали четыре года лагерей по сфальсифицированному уголовному обвинению, а Дедюлина вытеснили в эмиграцию. Но именно Рогинский был бессменным руководителем мемориала с самого начала до своей безвременной смерти 18 декабря 2017 года. Я хотел бы обратить внимание на то, что даже в условиях патриотарного режима СССР фактически вот этот альманах память при течь мемориала действовал, существовал, хотя тогда не было ни грантов, ни оплачиваемых сотрудников, не было ничего. И тем не менее, я, считаю, я полагаю, что это был очень успешный проект, тогда было очень много сделано. Арсений написал мне одну из э, первых книжек мемориала в начале 90-х. Да не сгинет мемориал. Не сгинул и не сгинет. И не сгинет. Более того, я э, вообще полагаю, что он намного переживет своих винителей и э, просто те, кто пытаются его ликвидировать формально, они, э, а именно российский авторитарный режим, он тем самым роет себе могилу, и э, я иначе это не вижу. А мемориал, даже формально ликвидированный российским властями, будет и дальше существовать, и переживет своих гонителей. Ведь действительно, этими действиями Россия ликвидирует вовсе не так называемых иностранных агентов. Она уничтожает свой научных исследований, закрывает рот, загоняет в подполье или, или выдавливает миграцию людей, которые желают помочь своей стране понять и осознать, трагедии советского прошлого, сохранить историческую память, наладить отношения с другими странами и сохранить свободу в России. Я думаю, что мы останемся, мы будем работать дальше, и мы будем еще более сильными, чем до всей этой истории. Спасибо за внимание. Comments for your thoughts. I think it's really, really good that you are from from Ukraine with us today. That's very, very important. Really. Now I would like to give the word to Tanya, Tanya Smith. She represents Friends of Memorial Australia and New Zealand. She has worked with Memorial since 1989. She's a lawyer specialized in international human rights and human rights in countries of the former Soviet Union. She opened and ran the regional Amnesty International office in Moscow. She was a human rights lawyer at the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Geneva. For 18 years, she was responsible for the countries of the former Soviet Union and Central Europe. She was a secretary of the Enforced Disappearances Mandate. She keeps working as consultant to the UN and other international organizations on human rights training legal analysis and strategic advising. Tanya, the floor is yours. We can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, hello, здравствуйте. Um, I'm very grateful for you to uh, giving us the opportunity to participate today. Um, as has been stated, um, my involvement with Memorial goes back to 1989. Uh, when I was uh, working on a Ford Foundation project 
to support the development of human rights law and lawyers. Um, I was responsible for organizing a large meeting in Moscow um, with lawyers from different countries and, and law professors. But it became very clear all through the planning and the meetings that in fact the real human rights people in Russia were Memorial. Um, Sergei Adamovich helped me with that meeting and um, it was quite interesting to see how difficult it was uh, culturally even for him to be able to come into this meeting with lawyers. Um, so in fact, the enormous meeting, meeting uh, in Russian demonstrations that were taking place on the streets at that time were being monitored by Memorial, not by lawyers. The, more, the Memorial Human Rights Hotspots Program was monitoring the ethnic and other conflicts across the USSR. I left my job in New York to come to, to support Memorial as a volunteer. Um, most of my time, I also was working for some foundations, just reporting to them on the development of human rights and, and law in, in, um, in the Soviet Union. But most of my time was spent with Memorial. I discussed with them the development of a mandate, the definition of what they would do and how they and what they would not do. In the beginning, they wanted to do everything. It was a euphoric time. The corridors were bulging with letters and people. Um, as other people have noted, people like Sanya Daniel was doing evening lectures for about the dissident movement for high school students. Um, that would go on for hours and the students were enthralled. Um, there were speakers on the death penalty in the basement of Memorial, in the growing library under Boris Bel uh, Belienkin, and his work on extremism, which all continues. Lena Zemkova was receiving thousands of letters regarding the Osterweiters, and Senya Ruginsky, who's been noted several times today, his mind was always running several steps ahead of everyone, his ideas always flowing. Um, and Memorial grew. There were issues, um, which there always are, um, but some people were primarily interested in the rehabilitation, other people not so interested in having the more controversial human rights action under the same organization. There were lean times and there were abundant and they were able to stay together. Um, so I was in Moscow volunteering with them and then Amnesty asked me to open their office there. Um, I had been a, a volunteer for Amnesty in the United States for over 10 years. And I understood how a mandate of a grassroots organization worked. And so I continued to work with Memorial and Amnesty understood that. And both organizations complemented each other very well. I traveled the length and width of, of Russia visiting Amnesty members, but mostly Memorial members who were much more involved in um, civil society and wanted to hear about uh, human rights. And I often would um, distribute publications from Virginia Zaharov and others. Um, so this cooperation continued with, with Memorial. Um, and I tried to express to them the importance how Amnesty had developed its mandate, mandate and kept its independence and non-politization um, and the importance of having a clear mandate, which Memorial has worked very hard to do. Um, then I, as has been noted, I worked at the United Nations and I continued to work very closely with Memorial. I think I've always considered it um, a great honor and uh, to work with them and support what they do. Um, so Memorial, often stayed with me in Geneva, even one night, the night before Sergei Adamovich spoke um, independently against the war in Chechnya before the international community. He stayed with me in my small apartment um, and the Russian ambassador called about midnight. So somehow they knew he was there at the UN staff member's home, which was not too good. But, um, and then later when the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights went to Chechnya, um, Memorial was on the plane with us from Moscow, going down to Ingushetia. Alia Garlov was there and was in, organizing important meetings for the High Commissioner um, with victims and victims' relatives of disappearances and arbitrary arrests and executions. Um, the government very much didn't want her to meet with Memorial and did everything they could to keep her away. 
taking us back to the hotel late at night when I knew and they knew that Memorial was waiting with these, these relatives of victims, very frightened. I saw in the darkness, I saw Alieg's face silhouetted by a cigarette and I, I yelled for the bus to stop. And so Mary Robinson sat with these relatives of victims for hours taking their testimony, which became her presentation to the international community um, just a few days later. On the basis of that, as far as I know, it's the only time in the history of the United Nations that a resolution has been adopted against one of the permanent five members of the Security Council. And that is truly due to Memorial and particularly Memorial in Chechnya, which we know has suffered very deeply. Um, So regarding Friends of Memorial in Australia and New Zealand, um, we exist here to support Memorial in whatever ways Memorial needs. We have a very small group of interested volunteers. Our role is to do what we can outside of Russia and in the region, in Australia or wherever we are asked to provide information. Last week, for example, I was asked to uh, provide information to an international NGO specialized on archives and human rights. They wanted to know more about the situation of Memorial's court appeals for their uh, international newsletter. I've been doing radio and TV interviews and our group has provided a special report to the United Nations last week, um, which was submitted to the UN Human Rights Committee specifically about Memorial and the foreign agents law. The UN Human Rights Committee, the highest um, treaty body in the United Nations on Human Rights had asked the government of Russia specifically about Memorial over a year ago. And the government uh, gave a very um, limited answer, I can say. And so I felt it was very important to um, fulfill the committee in on the, the full situation. Um, we've also been assisting lawyers in Russia to work with UN procedures, uh, both to support Memorial and other civil rights uh, and human rights organizations and mass media. Um, and most importantly, I'd like to say is, has been our cooperation with the Russian speaking community in Australia and New Zealand, which I will come to uh, later. Uh, regarding the question that was posed um, by the organizers, the third, the question of the significance of Memorial, um, we all feel the very deep significance of Memorial, um, and we understand that the recent court decisions to liquidate International Memorial and the Memorial Human Rights Center um, really have significance well beyond Memorial due to the message that closing Memorial, the most widely respected and known human rights organization in Russia and the region, that message sends to the rest of civil society in Russia. The message is that if, it's, if Memorial can be closed with the international awards and respects that it, it has, any organization can be closed. Many organizations in Russia and, and mass media have had to close themselves. Civil society as it has existed will no longer be permitted. The foreign agent laws have been amended over 30 times. I've written in, in great detail for the United Nations about the laws because they, they are very hard to understand. I consider that reading the definition of foreign agent is essential for everyone to understand. And I'm sorry if people here have already read it, but I'm going to try and just only read the part about the definition of foreign agent. As I said, the UN Human Rights Committee asked the Russian government for, for what, what does the, the, this law mean? And the Russian government gave the first sentence of what a foreign agent is. And they said that um, a foreign agent is a nonprofit organization acting as a foreign agent um, that receives money and other assets from foreign sources and participates um, in the interests of the foreign sources in political activities in the territory of Russia, which is a fair summary of the first line of what a foreign agent is. 
Um, it must be noted that at, including the, in the interests of the foreign sources or the assets, that requires no connection whatsoever to what the activities of the organization are. The rest of the definition is what one can only call shocking. And I highly recommend that you take a look at it if you haven't, but I will read it now for those that haven't, so that you understand how civil society cannot go on and the organizations that are going on right now and the mass media and the individuals in Memorial that we know for many years have had a knife hanging over their heads for several years that the rest of the world does not understand. So as I said, in that definition that the government read, it says that it's an organization that takes part in political activities in the territory of Russia. The definition of a political activity is that any nonprofit organization, with the exception of a political party, is recognized as participating in political activities carried out on the territory of the Russian Federation if, regardless of the goals and objectives specified in its charter, it carries out activities in the field of state building, protection of the foundations of the constitutional system of the Russian Federation, federal structure, protection of the federal structure of the Russian Federation, protecting the sovereignty and ensuring the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, ensuring the rule of law, ensuring the rule, law and order, state and public security, national defense, foreign policy, socioeconomic and national development of the Russian Federation, development of the political system, activities of state bodies, local governments, legislative regulation of the rights and freedoms of man and citizen in order to influence the development and implementation of state policy, the formation of state bodies, local governments, and their decision and actions. It is almost unbelievable to read. It is so clear and direct. Organizations are carrying out political activity if they want to protect rule of law. The government then gives examples. The activity is carried out in the following form. So these are the things that define political activity, which therefore defines one as a foreign agent. If any organization or media receives any kind of asset or support, which can be very broadly defined, um, these are the foreign agents. So participation in the organization and conduct of public events in the form of meetings, rallies, demonstrations, processes or pickets in various combinations of these forms, organization and conduct of public debates, discussions and speeches. This is exactly what Memorial does and should be doing and what civil society needs to do. Further, participation in activities aimed at obtaining a certain result in elections, referendum. So this is political activity, I would agree. Um, the activity of political parties. Further, public appeals to state bodies. Now this one is really shocking. So any address to a state official, memorial writing to the foreign ministry about a refugee, any organization addressing um, a local official on any kind of public issue, that's considered political activity and it will get one defined as a foreign agent. Then I would just wanna to come to the very final point um, regarding the Russian speaking community abroad. Um, it is good to know that the Russian speaking community abroad is working together and exercising their right of expression, association and assembly. From my experience in Australia, I can see this development in contrast to more than 30 years ago when I started working with Memorial. Um, 
as one wise observer and longtime supporter of civil society in another Soviet foreign, uh, former Soviet Republic recently told me, now it seems the future of Russia to a great extent is in its new diaspora. In Australia, we have the association Alliance Svoboda, which has active people across Australia and New Zealand interested in promoting democracy and values associated with it in Russia. The model of how Friends of Memorial in Australia and New Zealand recently worked with Alliance Svoboda, I thought was a very good model for other um, groups of Russian communities. We as Friends of Memorial separately, uh, independently worked in great cooperation when Alliance Svoboda on 16 January held 10 demonstrations across cities, uh, across Australia and New Zealand in support of the Memorial. Um, this was, they were very, very well organized and uh, well documented and distributed, disseminated. Um, and I think this is a very good uh, way to, to cooperate. Um, the final question I would like to pose just that came up to my mind during this meeting is the question of the Nobel Prize. As I think we're all aware, um, I think it's Estonia has nominated Memorial for the, the Nobel Prize. And perhaps it is something that um, some of us might want to get behind um, because I think that could bring more attention to Memorial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya, for your contribution. We are moving fast to the end of the first part. Unfortunately, Jens Siegert, who was the former head of the Moscow Office of Heinrich Bell Foundation, could not be with us um, because of personal reasons, but I appreciate his participation in preparing this event. We now have Stepan Chernoshek came back to us. I would ask him to be brief for the sake of our friends in Moscow, where it's very late indeed. Uh, he is, uh, Stepan is the founder and leader of Czech Republic Memorial. He is a member of the board of the International Memorial. And uh, he organized four expeditions to abandon Gulag camps in Siberia, created a section of recorded testimonies with Chechen witnesses. He also was an OSCE election observer during elections in Ukraine and in Russia. Please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for uh, organizing this uh, very important international uh, event. And I think it shows us how important uh, work of Memorial is. And I would say that uh, Memorial Society is extremely important for the Czech Republic. Uh, our Czech Memorial branch is the official branch of International Memorial, uh, but it's uh, mainly an association of people who have uh, already somehow cooperated with uh, Memorial in Russia. Czech uh, academics, historians, students, or human rights uh, activists. And the main goal of Czech Memorial is to support Russian Memorial and to present its projects uh, in the Czech Republic. So we don't have any special own projects uh, that are not based directly on the projects of our Russian partners. Uh, the Czech branch was established a few years ago because uh, more and more people uh, from the Czech Republic cooperated with Memorial uh, more and more intensively. Uh, and uh, these are, for example, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes or our Gulag CZ Association or some other human rights organizations. And it has become, become clear that uh, the topic of Soviet repressions concerns uh, Czech history much more than previously was thought. And thanks to Memorial, we know the names of thousands of Czechs executed and persecuted in the uh, USSR. More than 1,300 Czechs were executed, mainly during the Great Terror, and thousands more were imprisoned uh, in the Gulag or they were victims of other sorts of repressions, for example, Kulak deportations. Uh, if there were no memorial databases, we in the Czech Republic won't know much about this history. Czech textbooks do not speak about the Czech dimension of Soviet repressions. It is a relatively new topic uh, for us in, in, in Czech. Yeah. So it's very important for us to memorial and it's 
it's not possible either cooperation without memorial in this. Uh, so there, let me say just a couple of words of some common projects uh, with memorial and Czech organizations. Uh, for example, so together with uh, a unified uh, across uh, memorial databases and it is accessible at the website uh, memsearch.org. Uh, there are 17 databases of uh, various memorials, memorial databases. Uh, we have been also developing an educational tool on the Gulag and Soviet repression. Uh, it's uh, an international tool with partners from uh, Slovakia, Poland, from Germany, with the uh, German branch of memorial we cooperate. And we use uh, our experience uh, from mapping uh, abandoned Gulag camps uh, in Siberia uh, during Gulag season expeditions. And we work with uh, virtual and augmented reality. And memorial, uh, Russian memorial, is absolutely uh, essential for us in these projects. Uh, we also develop. Uh, we are also developing the Russian version of this tool, and it should be uh, it should be done uh, next year. Uh, we also have a uh, Czech version of uh, Returning the Names project. We publicly read the names of executed Czechs in the USSR on October the 30th. And we have also Czech version of Last Address projects, uh, which uh, was successful transferred to the Czech Republic. It's conducted by the Institute uh, for Study of Totalitarian Regimes. And it also commemorates uh, Czech victims of Czechoslovak communist uh, regime. So uh, Memorial has always been open to cooperation uh, with uh, Czech colleagues, and we will therefore continue to support Memorial as much as possible. Uh, we opened a collection just three weeks ago, and we have collected since now more than five thousand uh, dollars from more than 150 Czech citizens. And we are thinking about uh, other possibilities, how to help uh, our Russian colleagues. And of course, we are in touch with them. And uh, maybe this event uh, will be the start of a bigger international support of Memorial. So thank you once again for organizing it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stepan. Um, Great. So now we will continue with Alexander Shishlov. Um, Alexander, you're with us. Great. So Dr. Alexander Shishlov is a member of the St. Petersburg Legislative Assembly, where he chairs the two-person caucus of the United Democratic Party, Yabloka. And he is one of a handful of elected from democratic opposition across Russia. From 2012 until 2021, he was St. Petersburg Human Rights Offic Commissioner and he is Vice President of the European Ombudsman Institute. Dr. Shishlov has a graduate degree in physics and math and a law degree as well. He was first elected to Leningrad City Council in 1990 and was a member of the Duma from 1995 to 2003, where he chaired the Committee on Education and Science. Alexander, I hand the word over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you, Christina, for the introduction and thank Dr. Glinsky for the invitation and for all the participants. I'd like to thank you for joining today's meetings and uh, to express the solidarity with Memorial. Uh, now, at this time, uh, I'm a leader of Yabloko faction in St. Petersburg Legislative Assembly. And by the way, I have the uh, memorial membership card for more than 30 years from uh, 1990. Uh, I'm not afraid to repeat uh, what has already been said by Pavel Litvinov and other speakers. I think that preserving the memory of the victims of political repression in the Soviet Union and the memorial's mission are very important not only for my country, but for everyone who does respect the universal values of human rights and freedoms. Uh, maybe some of you know that we have in Russia the concept of the state policy to perpetuate the memory, victims, the memory of victims of political repression. 
This concept was adopted by the Russian federal government uh, in 2015. But the problem is the real politics and the developments of the Russian legislation and law enforcement practice are very far from the declarations of this concept. As you know, the memorial is liquidated by the decision of the Supreme Court on the changes of violating of so-called foreign agents law. Uh, Yavlaka party proposes to exclude uh, these uh, provisions, the provisions of persons and organizations performing the functions of foreign agents from the Russian, Russian legislation. We assess the legislation on so-called foreign agents as discriminatory, illegal, uh, contrary to the constitution of the Russian Federation, the European Convention on Human Rights, as legislation directed against the development of civil society and at strengthening Russians, Russia's uh, self-isolation. Our proposal is an alternative to several projects on making some technical amendments of the legislation. I must note that the party is now taking, uh, talking about amendments uh, recently voted for the legislation on foreign agents in the state Duma, including MPs supported by so-called smart vote for those who speak Russian umne голосование. And uh, its predecessors such as vote for anyone but United Russia. I think this is a good point to remind that today in Russia, the human rights activity is inseparable from political activity. And if human rights activists distance themselves from elections, from politics, then this leads to serious consequences. I suggest that everyone who stands for universal values of human rights and freedom support the Yabloka proposal no matter how unrealistic the demand of the abolition of the concept of foreign agents may seem to someone. In Russia, it is often said that the legislation on foreign agents exists in many countries and exists in even tougher form. In my opinion, this is not true. This is not the case. For instance, the well-known US Foreign Agent Registration Act as far as I know, has a completely different legal structure and practice. So using this opportunity, I'd like to ask today international audience to look at the legislation in the countries where you live and share the information about the experience of legislative protection from foreign influence on political life. Because this kind of protection is a real issue, but it can be solved by the law on foreign agents as we have now in my country. I am completing now and thank you again for the solidarity with Memorial. Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Александр Владимирович. Это нас большая честь, что вы сегодня с нами. Thank you for being with us today and for your very important thoughts and suggestions that actually are a call to action. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to do here today is to uh, understand what action is best for Memorial. Now we are turning to the final speaker in our first section and really our keynote speaker because we are really gathered here to show our solidarity with Memorial leadership and members and uh, to uh, uh, find the best ways to support it. Uh, Jan Zbigniewicz Raczynski is the chair of the board of the International Memorial Society. He is also a member of the board of the Memorial Human Rights Center and its former chair of the board in the 1990s. He is a computer programmer by training. He has led the creation of Memorial's database of victims of political reprisals with over 3 million entries. Uh, in the 1990s, he also conducted Memorial's work in the hotspots of conflict in the North Caucasus, including Chechnya. And he authored a book on Moscow street names. Ну, прежде всего, как и все, я хочу поблагодарить за организацию такого представительного собрания. И очень приятно видеть и всех знакомых, со многими давно не, не получалось увидеться, и видеть а, людей, с которыми раньше или не был знаком, или был знаком только заочно а, по переписке. А, спасибо всем за поддержку. И а, спасибо за стремление помочь. Мне кажется, что эта солидарность очень важна. А, 
И важно показывает, что э, мемориал — это не организация сама в себе. Это дело важное для, а, не только для России, не только для бывшего Советского Союза, но, думаю, что и для всего мира. А, потому что главное, а, что показал процесс, в чем, а, почему мемориал так неудобен а, государству нашему российскому. Потому что мемориал — это а, главное, в первую очередь, это о человеке. Это... Сначала человек, а государство – это значит, инструмент его обслуживающий. И именно эта позиция неприемлема для государства. В равной степени неприемлема и критика сегодняшнего государства, которое нарушает права человека чудовищным образом. Тут, я думаю, не нужно пояснений. И критика государства бывшего, потому что для нынешней российской власти, к сожалению, государство стало а, идолом, а, превратилось в фетиш, и а, критика а, государства – это разрушение властной концепции. И не случайно прокурор а, так акцентировал претензию, которой нет, впрочем, в официальном иске, что мемориал представ... ложно представляет СССР как террористическое государство. Я думаю, в этом собрании нет необходимости обсуждать этот тезис. И мне кажется, что проблема вот это вот противостояние личности и государства, она не сводится только к российским или только к постсоветским и посткоммунистическим странам. И именно эта проблема центральная почему, собственно, и деятельность нашего общества вызывает такой широкий отклик. И я еще раз хочу поблагодарить всех за вот эту вот поддержку и сказать, что она очень важна. Она, в общем, думаю, что влияет на наше будущее. Мы... И опять-таки хотел бы всех успокоить, что... Да, конечно, проблемы есть, но вот именно то, что э, собираются такие группы людей, показывает, что так или иначе наша деятельность будет продолжаться. Еще раз спасибо всем. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. This is really, it's really good to hear this from you. Um, we are really honored that you are with us tonight. First of all, many, many thanks to Jan Zbigniewicz for being with us. It's really a great honor and. Uh, really the core of our tonight's uh, uh, conversation. And now I want to introduce Nina Rumiantseva, who is one of our organizers, a uh, board member of our association. There are several board members of the American-Russian Speaking Association present here today. If they are, I'd like also to use this uh, chance to uh, ask them to um, uh, show their hand. I have uh, Dmitry Ilushin here, uh, who is a board member, uh, Yulia Krotova, and Nina Romantseva, who will show the slide, who will do the slideshow.
Thank you for watching. Thank you, Nina. We are uh, moving to a second part, which will be significantly shorter than the first. I ask everyone who is listed here in the second part to speak, be brief, to speak within uh, three minutes uh, of your time. Пожалуйста, держитесь в пределах трех минут. I will uh, read the list of the people who uh, have volunteered to talk about their families. Uh, their family history and its relation to memorial and its universal significance. I would like to start with Sasha Kulaeva, whom I will introduce. Uh, your, uh, Sasha Kulaeva is a lecturer at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po, and also a senior human rights and civil society expert in Paris. She has been a member of Memorial in Russia since 1993 and has lived in France for over 25 years, where she is a member of the French Memorial since its creation. Please. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Well, in Paris, it's already <laughs> quite late. So um, I will try to stay brief because I guess everybody's a bit tired, but I think it's very important for all of us to be here and to, 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 to say some words of solidarity indeed. Um, I think that it actually catches up what uh, Jan was saying in his speech at the, at the end of the first part that memorial is not only about the memory and the institution of memorial but also about the people and about the every one of us and our personal histories and i just wanted to briefly mention mine uh, my grandfather was in gulag and uh, told us a lot about his gulag experience he was lucky enough to be one of those who was released um, because of uh, Yezhov, uh, though, when he, Yezhov was arrested and they needed to release some people. So he got out alive, although with a damaged health. Um, and uh, my uh, mother, his daughter, uh, was brought up in the family where her father had a broken life and very difficult personal history because of all of that, which he described in his memories, which are now available on Sakharov Center uh, website. His name was Mark Batvinnik, Mark Naumovich Batvinnik. And so his both daughters actually were active in dissident uh, movement later on in Moscow and in St. Petersburg and participated in the Foundation for the Support of Political Prisoners. Uh, and that's the house where I was born and grew up, surrounded with dissidents and their uh, families, because some of these people I only knew. Uh, for a big part of my life through letters, which I actually was writing to uh, many of them to Gulag, and that's how I learned to write. Also, my parents took me to exile of people they were visiting, especially my mother. She went, she traveled to Magadan to visit Sergei Kovalev and to Kazakhstan to visit Tatiana Velikanova. And um, against the will of her family, she was taking us small kids by then with her uh, to some of these travels. So indeed, I think that it influenced both me and my sister. And it's not by chance that we became members of Memorial as eight people of our family were. My grandfather, starting with him, uh, my mother, my aunt, my father, me, my sister, and some other members of our family we were all active in Memorial and actually working there for different periods of my life. Uh, and um, my mother was working in St. Petersburg Memorial, and my sister is now a director of Belgian Memorial because uh, it was actually the first memorial which was declared for an agent, and the first Russian NGO which was declared for an agent by court in 1213. And they had to leave Russia by then. The whole team actually left, and now they work from Belgium. So, uh, what I wanted to say, and I know the time is short is that memorial is not an institution, it's a choice of life, very formatating choice of life and continuation of the personal history of every one of those who is uh, uh, taking part in it. And um, I think it counts a lot. It counts to me to be a memorial member for years already. Uh, indeed, it was an obvious choice to join the French memorial when it was created. Uh, it was also the 
big honor to be among those who try to support Memorial in nowadays. And uh, when we knew two days ago that Memorial is now accused of uh, kind of rehabilitation of Nazism, it was the same day uh, I received a letter from my former teacher in school, in 168 school in St. Petersburg, who was actually fired, kicked out of her position because she was reading Harms, Daniel Harms with her students. And uh, official reason was that Harms collaborated with Nazis and that's why she shouldn't read his poems to her students. So for me, uh, you know, I was 19 when Memorial was created or 18 or something and all my life was with Memorial and was formatted by Memorial, was influenced by Memorial. Uh, the history of my family actually twists with the history of Memorial in my mind. And I'm sure that it's a case of all our generations, those who grew up with Soviet Union falling down and Memorial being created. So it's closure for us, it's a closure of a formatating period of our lives and of history of Russia. And uh, it goes together with this absolutely absurdic Orwellian uh, formulations of collaboration or rehabilitation of Nazism, just like calling a teacher who is reading harms uh, with her students, uh, also um, rehabilitation of, of the Nazis. So that's why I'm here tonight and I'm very happy to see here a lot of familiar faces. Uh, some of them I know uh, since years and years and dozens of years. And um, I just wanted to say that it's extremely important to stay in contact. And I think with those of you with whom we are not yet in contact, we can get in touch through the respective memorials of our countries or through the organizers of this forum and not to lose each other again, because I think it's more important than ever to be together and to be with memorial. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. It was really good to hear your personal story. Great. Um, now, I would like to give the word to Ivan Kovalyov. Um, he's the son of Sergei Kovalyov, and he is member of the board of the Saharov Foundation. Ivan, if you're here, I think you are. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, great. The floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um... The time limit was uh, three minutes, I might be shorter. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, uh, long past uh, time, 1974, when uh, KGB persecuted Chronicle of Current Events and because of the blackmail, the issues of uh, uh, Chronicle were uh, postponed. And uh, then, uh, then my father, Tatiana Velikanova and uh, Alexandra Lavut um, renewed it and they took responsibility for distribution of the magazine. And before they did it, uh, there was a um, conversation between my father and Andrei Dmitrich Sakhar, they were friends, uh, when, uh, when my father asked um, Andrei Dmitrich's uh, opinion whether to start Chronicle again or not. And uh, uh, the word of Sakharov was uh, the Chronicle is the most important thing that we have today. And uh, uh, now Memorial is the most important thing that we currently have. And it is uh, at most importance to, um, to do our best to preserve uh, uh, its work and uh, support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, great to have you here with us today. Uh, now we have also a few members of the board of our recently, last year, founded uh, International uh, Council of the Russian Diaspora for Ending Political Reprisals, uh, Vipuskai, we call it Vipuskai, let our people out, so to speak. Uh, and one of them is Nadia uh, Chernova, who is in Barcelona and just had an uh, um, uh, anti-war rally there against uh, Putin's aggression on Ukraine. And Nadia, are you with us? Nadia Buidgovait-Paruski, Nadia Chernova, Barcelona. Uh, 
участница совета директоров нашей международной ассоциации за прекращение политрепрессий в России. Я очень благодарна за такую интересную встречу. И очень волнительно, очень интересно. И очень жаль, конечно, что у нас в Испании нет никакого филиала мемориала. Я думаю, что, в принципе, это, конечно, нужно как-то восполнять. Знаю одного переводчика, которому очень нравится Шаламов, который переводил Шаламова и знакома с ним, его, читала его книги. И думаю, что тоже как-то мы присоединимся к, к истории с мемориалом. Моя, я думаю, что репрессии, наверное, прошли по большей части наших родственников, наших семей, которые жили в Советском Союзе. И я очень рада, что в моей семье не было никаких карательных родственников, предков, не было никого НКВД. В общем, моя семья не очень пострадала от репрессий. Ну, конечно, пострадала, но не совсем так, как... У других есть очень трагичные истории. Моя маленькая история. Я, я, в общем, мои корни из украинского села. Мой прадед, у него был по отцовской линии, у него была земля, за которую его решили, землю экспроприировали, его решили расстрелять. Мой прадед сбежал в Канаду, где удачно прожил до 1971 года. Но вместо него репрессировали моего, его сына, моего деда. Отправили в Нижний Тагил, потом в Самарскую Куйбышевскую область, где он работал на шахте, познакомился с моей бабушкой. Бабушка, в общем, из Самарской губернии, она приехала, она поехала работать на шахту, и таким образом могла получить паспорт, потому что по-другому невозможно было выехать. Там они познакомились, зарегистрировались, мой дед взял фамилию моей бабушки. И уже в 1947 году вернулись в Украину всей семьей с русской фамилией Чернов. Это фамилия моей бабушки. Ну, в общем-то, они... прадед прожил в Канаде, писал письма, присылал посылки, никогда не приезжал, присылал фотографии. Я помню это в детстве. И в 1971 году после его смерти прислал, прислали документа на следствие. Деда, конечно, вызвали в нужные органы и с таким вопросом, нужно ли ему вражеское наследство. Дед отказался. А наследство мы до сих пор ничего не знаем. В общем, мы в неведении, куда оно исчезло, как, что там было, там был дом какой-то. Со стороны бабушки на моей по, по маминой линии были пострадавшие, это ее первый муж, которого посадили на 14 лет за то, что он а не играя в футбол, он разбил стекло на портрете Сталина. Это было перед войной, 1938 год. Ну, их маленькая дочка умерла, и, в общем, это была трагедия, потому что бабушка моя очень любила деда, и я много слышала этих историй от соседок-подружек еще в моем детстве а, 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 ну, об этом безумстве. Было, конечно, очень много репрессий со стороны знакомых. Ну, в общем, такие истории. Обыкновенно бытовые истории. У меня все. Спасибо большое. Спасибо, Надя. Мы, к сожалению, всем уже не сможем дать слово, даже, наверное, тем, кто перечислен был, поскольку мы уже работаем два часа, и из уважения к людям в Европе, у которых уже поздняя ночь, я хотел бы просто призвать тех, кто не, сегодня не выступает или не сможет выступить, присылать нам свои или видеозаписи, или фотографии из их семейных архивов и вообще активизировать ту работу, которая может быть полезна мемориалу. Можно связаться с нами, мы перешлем это мемориалу или напрямую в мемориал, потому что у нас очень много людей в разных странах, чьи семьи затронуты были репрессиями, и мы хотим ну, меру наших сил помочь мемориалу эту работу развивать и дальше, тем более с учетом того, что у нас у него у мемориала столько официальных отделений и неформальных друзей в разных странах мира. As I said, we want everybody who will not be able to speak today to send us uh, and to memorial direct. You can reach both of us or one of us and we'll 
communicate your message, send us your uh, written memories about your family, uh, your uh, documents, if uh, you have any uh, in your family uh, from Soviet uh, times, from Soviet persecution, your video testimonies, and that will, uh, I think, help uh, memorial, help uh, people uh, there to continue their work, uh, to reignite some of it uh, from the diaspora. So that's my call to action, my personal call to action. Uh, now let's um, give the floor to those countries that haven't been represented. Is there a Peter Nikitin here from Belgrade? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. Uh, okay, Peter. Which whichever one would you prefer to speak? The floor. I'm. I'm, I'm. right here. I'll speak in English. I'll. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I'm not. Uh, uh, this is a. It's, it's a great honor to be. Uh, uh, speaking to such an audience, and myself, I am not a, a human rights activist of any kind or an activist of any kind. I'm just a concerned Russian citizen who happens to live in Serbia. Um, we tried to organize some protests here, but that's about as much as I have done in my life for these causes. Uh, but I'm very grateful for the, this opportunity to uh, to say a few words about uh, my own uh, family history. Um, I'd like to talk about the fate of my great grandfather, who was called Eduard Balk Feldbau. Um, he was born uh, at the turn of the 20th century in the West Ukrainian town of Rogatin, which was then Austria-Hungary, and he was a native German speaker and then. Uh, an Austrian citizen who came to Russia during the First World War. He, he was um, uh, captured prisoner of war and he stayed there. He embraced the Russian Revolution. He married my great grandmother who was a professional revolutionary and adopted uh, Moscow as his, as his new home. And uh, in 1937, he lived in Moscow, worked as chief economist in the Ministry of Healthcare Department responsible for resource management. In March of that year, he was arrested, accused of taking part in an anti-Soviet terrorist group. Uh, on 1st of August 1937, he was convicted and uh, executed on the same day. Uh, it was one of the so-called list convictions of some 45,000 people, I believe, whose names were listed by the NKVD for execution and uh, after they were personally signed off by Stalin. And my great-grandfather, Eduard, was 37 years old. Uh, his murder had grave consequences, which, you know, for my family, which persist until today. Um, his wife, who was my great grandmother, was also arrested, shipped, shipped off to Gulag for, uh, I believe, 18 years in total. Their daughter and son, uh, their son was my, my grandfather. Uh, they were 12 and 10 years old, respectively. They were sent off to orphanages. And uh, it's with absolute horror that I'm imagining the feelings of a, of a 10 year old child whose parents are taken away and who's given away to a military orphanage like my grandfather Lev was. He had grown up a deeply traumatized man um, that affected several generations of our family and the ripple effects of, of this crime continue, and this is just one crime among hundreds of thousands. Um, so all that I know um, is thanks to Memorial, and it is thanks to their work that, you know, this my personal family tragedy is documented and can be told to this family's future generations. And uh, it's thanks to their work that the memory of the victims of these crimes lives on and not just as a side note and kind of our historical knowledge, but there are real names and faces uh, of people just like us who had their innocent lives destroyed. And uh, I'm, I'm about to finish, but uh, I'm wondering if I could just share my screen for a very brief moment to show you the, the mugshot of 
my uh, great grandfather. Uh, that's him, that's his mugshot. And, um, you know, it's the face of a man who is younger than I am today. And uh, it's a man who, like me, is, is a father of two children. And uh, he looks, he looks at me, you know, with full of mortal fear that he will never again see those children and maybe a glimmer of hope that he still might. And uh, I can see his resemblance to me, to other members of my family. And I can see that the, the blood that was spilled, that was my blood as well. And I also see clear resemblance between those who are who spilled that his blood and those who are now trying to erase what remains of his memory and the memory of other victims by trying to shut down Memorial. 80 years on, they're still making lists and they're still destroying families. And they're still, as we know, conducting executions. And I hope the world will finally turn its side to that and check their, their, their bloody work. So that's, that's all from me. Thank you, Peter. We have uh, two people from Israel who are asking, but I think only one. Uh, we can have time, either Allah or uh, Leonid, only two or three minutes. Uh, and then, I, I think Leonid Priceman would be would be very good if uh, okay. I give my my time to Leonid Priceman. Thank you, okay? Leonid. And okay. I just want to thank you for this uh, unforg unforgettable meeting, and this is so important what you are doing here. I'm so impressed and so embarrassed that in Israel we don't have this organization. As Misha said, Michal Rifkin. Добрый день. Я очень, я просто счастлив, что я имею возможность сегодня выступить. Я много, я, я историк из Израиля. Я много лет связан с мемориалом. Я, я участвовал в различных программах мемориала. В мемориале состоялась презентация одной из моих пос, последних книг, посвященной гражданской войне на русском, на русском севере о огненные годы русского севера 1918-1920 год. Но я хотел бы говорить не об этом. Мемориал, с моей точки зрения, делает святую работу. То, что в Израиле делает Яд Вашем, то, что делает государство Израиль, которое получает колоссальную помощь со всего мира, она восстанавливает имена людей, уничтоженных нацистским режимом. Одна общественная организация, которая последние годы существует в условиях чудовищного давления, в условиях объявления ее иностранным агентом и различных преследований, делает, делает мемориал. И вот в завершении всего тем полным подавлением гражданского общества, которое сегодня существует в России, с тем, что всех людей, которые имеют свое собственное мнение, объявляют иностранными агентами, власти решили задушить мемориал. Причем это делается совершенно омерзительно. Это делается, что мне особенно стыдно говорить при помощи историка из моей страны Ароза Шнейра который я всегда считал хорошим историком и порядочным человеком. Можно сказать, что вы использовали, но не особенно активно протестовал против того, что его использовали. И назвать эту организацию, которая стремится не допустить того, что произошло в нацистском Германии и в России, назвать эту организацию объявить в том, что она реабилитирует нацистских преступников, в этом заключается тот чудовищный цинизм, который сегодня, который сегодня происходит в России. И наша цель сделать все, чтобы мемориал продолжал свою работу. К сожалению, нет отделения мемориала в Израиле. Оно теперь обязательно должно быть создано, создано учитывая ту довольно некрасивую роль, которую сыграл один из израильских историков. Большое спасибо всем за внимание. 
Спасибо, спасибо, Леонид. This was Леонид Прайсман, historian from Israel. We have one final speaker, uh, Сергей Цветков from Estonia. Сергей Цветков, member of the board of the Russian Diaspora Council uh, uh, to end political repressions. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, at first, uh, something uh, about uh, my family, uh, my uh, grand uh, brother, uh, two brothers of, of my grand grandfathers, uh, um, was the victim of um, Gulag. Uh, um, uh, Kellerman Alexander uh, was born in uh, 80, 1894 in uh, Tsarskoye Selo, Friedenthal. Uh, he was a um, um, Russian German colonist. Um, uh, was um, um, convicted by, by Troika NKVD on 1937. Uh, and uh, uh, on 10 years uh, camps. Uh, and uh, my um, uh, other uh, of, uh, brother of my other grand grandfather, uh, keyboard um, uh, friends, uh, was um, uh, Lithuanian. And um, uh, uh, he was um, uh, shooted by uh, sentences um, of Troika and Kvd2. Uh, in, in, at 1937, uh, uh, um, um, only because uh, it first uh, was uh, German and second was Lithuanian. It's an um, example of uh, Russian Nazism, I think, and so Soviet Nazism. Uh, and, and second, uh, I, I um, uh, have told about our film. We make uh, we made a um, uh, film about uh, Gulag camp in Narva. It was an, 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 uh, at uh, 2018. And we won with this film uh, a first prize on uh, film festival as Doc in Toronto. Uh, this film with English subtitles, I can uh, make a commentary or a link for you, for us, for all. Um, because it um, upload in internet, uh, and uh, maybe it's interesting. And uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak today. I just want to briefly recognize those who had no chance to speak, but uh, uh, we most welcome them to send their uh, remarks to us uh, in writing uh, or in other format, we'll add them to the material. I want to recognize Andrew Gigoyenko, uh, the chairman of the General Petro Gigoyenko Foundation and our great collaborator for many years. I want to recognize Simon Cosgrove of, of Rights in Russia, the organization based in the United Kingdom, uh, and thank him as well for help with preparing this event. Now the floor is to Christina and we conclude. Yeah, thank you, Dmitry. Thank you, yeah, to everyone. Um, it was a great pleasure to be your moderator tonight but also yeah to to listen to you to get to know you it's great to see that memorial has so many friends and members and great motivated interesting super intelligent people this is yeah it's great it was of course also very impressive to hear your personal stories very touching thank you thank you so much now we all know that on the 28th of February, the second um, hearing will, will be like the, the, I don't know, how is it called? The, the appeal hearing will take place. Um, we definitely should be active um, from the side of Germany. I know that we will do some kind of a demonstration in front of the embassy as we did already. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that we all together can do, can do something. We 
most probably won't change the verdict, but still we show, and we did this also with this um, event today, we showed solidarity and we have to continue because as many of you said, Memorial, we are all Memorial and Memorial can't be closed. It can be closed somewhere at some place, but the people still exist and we are the people and we are all Memorial. So thank you for, thank you so much for you being, being here. And yeah, thank you of course, Mitri for your organization. And I hope to continue with you and to hear other stories, other personal stories. Thank you. And now you. Um, Dmitri will conclude. Yes, thank you very much, Christina. It was a great pleasure to moderate this jointly with you. Thank you everyone who joined us and uh, uh, shared their very important ideas. I think we should follow up on a number of them that I heard and we should work on this together, formal and informal partners of Memorial. I appreciate that you have been with us so late in spite of your time zone difference, so late uh, night in Europe and so early morning uh, in Australia. Uh, and uh, I'm really uh, truly humbled by uh, you know, what a great, uh, uh, a great range of speakers joined us today and whom we heard from. And thank you again. We'll be definitely in touch. Please send us your materials, those who haven't been able to speak. Uh, for others uh, who are with us uh, on other events, uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, the American Russian Speaking Association is holding uh, discussions related to uh, the Russian diaspora every month. The next one will be in the end of March, but that will be announced on Facebook, on our website. You're welcome to follow uh, with us there and have a great rest of your day, night, and morning. Bye-bye.